to be with you all. Uh, and so I look, I look forward to our continued conversations. Today is going to be a little bit different than the other days because I've just like dumped enormous amounts of information on you the other days, which I'm still going to do. Don't worry. I, uh, I, I will deliver on that. Um, but uh, I want to, there, there are a few things that we didn't get to last week that I want to start with. And, uh, and so there'll be, it'll be similar in that sense for, for the first 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and then I want to um, respond to some questions that you all have sent. Um, and so, so I'll respond to questions as we go. I've kind of worked in uh, ways to, um, cover questions you've sent me, like when I cover this information. But the majority of our time uh, today will be looking at a "What can we do now?" which is also an answer to or you know, engaging one of the questions that was um, a couple of questions that was sent to me. So, um, what can we do now? And so I'll be unpacking Jamar Tisby's what he calls the arc of social justice uh, from a Christian perspective. And so I'll give you that as well as a reading list, kind of like you know further reading. Um, uh, and so when we get there, I'll, I'll show that to you, and uh, I'll show that, and I've passed that along to others who can pass that along to you, the, the handout for the ARC. All right, so let me go ahead and start here really quickly and jump in where we left off last week and finish up a few things. Okay, you're seeing that okay now? All right, good deal. Um, and so we left off, I, I was telling you about the, one of the white evangelical problems of race relations, which is white evangelicals view the world in individualistic lenses uh, and therefore explain the problems with our society uh, from an individualist perspective and the solutions from an individualist perspective um, have a lot of trouble seeing systems or policies or laws as the, as the key problem or the key fix. Uh, and so I, I left off with uh, that. So let me jump back in there. Um, there are a few things I wanted to cover. So first of all, Black Lives Matter, you know the Black Lives uh, Matter movement just emerged you know, in the last 10 years or so. Um, a lot of people had hoped when President Barack Obama uh, became the you know, first black president, there was talk of you know, post-racial America and things like this. And of course, you all are aware, uh, the exact opposite uh, showed up. Uh, we entered a significant period of, of racial animosity. And so in 2012, um, there was a neighborhood watch commander named George Zimmerman who shot and killed a 17-year-old named Trayvon Martin in Florida. Um, and when he was acquitted in 2013, this is when people like Alicia Garza lamented publicly in a social media post. She said Black Lives Matter. And then Patrice uh, Con Cullers followed it up with a hashtag Black Lives Matter and the hashtag took off in 2013. These women with Opal Tometi um, organized a movement building project that we know today as Black Lives Matter. And so this, this Black Lives Matter movement, it, it's a member led global network, more than 40 chapters deliberately uh, adaptive and decentralized, very organic, very localized. And of course, that's recently caused some problems. There's been some major debates between the chapters and the national and global um, organizations. But just be aware, Black Lives Matter emerged. And I'll read you what Black Lives Matter says on their, or their site, um, most recently, uh, their, their mission. Black Lives Matter Global Network is a global organization in the US, UK, and Canada whose mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by state, by the state and vigilantes. By combating and countering acts of violence, creating space for black imagination and innovation and centering black joy, we are winning immediate improvements in our lives. So the primary goal or the end of Black Lives Matter has been to stop unjust killings by police officers. Uh, and to reform policing in American cities. That's been like a, one of the, the key things they're trying to do. Um, now, some members obviously have other agendas, but reforming policing has been the primary aim of Black Lives Matter. Um, and so they use direct action protests and promote, they have, there's 10 specific police reforms that are also uh, promoted by, a, it's called Campaign Zero, if you want to look that up and check that out. These are the, the basic, like, here's what we want to see changed. Uh, and so the leaders of Black Lives Matter and the vast majority of its members um, also are in the MLK tradition in terms of promoting nonviolent means to achieve the end of unjust killings, especially of Black men and, and Black boys uh, by police. Now, um, you all have uh, heard, no doubt, in your particular uh, situation, your particular context, have um, heard some of these arguments. Let me just give you, I've, I've tried to understand why do some, why do some 
white Christians oppose Black Lives Matter? Why do some white Christians oppose Black Lives Matter movement? And so conservative white Christians, I found four things in my just trying to read through and trying to understand what's going on. You know, one of the questions today was like, how do we have conversations with people that seem to like disregard facts? You know what I mean? Uh, well, one is try to understand what people are actually saying. I think that's one, you know, sometimes it's hard to do that, but to understand where people are coming from and then you can meet them where they're at in a conversation. But for, especially for conservative uh, white Christians, one of the reasons that they oppose Black Lives Matter is because Black Lives Matter promotes L LGBTQ issues, um, and thus conservative white Christians see that as an attack on the nuclear family, right? So families, values, voters, and the and the and the right uh, politically and the religious right have have emphasized, you know, fam quote unquote family values, um, and one of the things that they see as the foundation of society. Uh, is the nuclear family between, you know, a man and a woman and, and their kids. And so Black Lives Matter, I mean, at the very top of the leadership, um, you know, we have trans and lesbian black women who are leading this thing. It's, it's, the, it's, it's, I mean, like the, both sexuality and religion, it is a embrace of all. Uh, it's really a, you know, it's a beautiful thing in terms of when you go on the side, I mean, there's this embrace of, of black life, of um, sexual minorities who have also been attacked uh, recently uh, and throughout our history. And so it's an embrace of all that. And it's like on, it's from the very beginning because it's wrapped up in who Black Lives Matter is. And so some conservative white, white Christians will see that and say, no, um, we don't like that. A second big thing that you see uh, when you see white Christians opposing Black Lives Matter is um, a mistaken view that Black Lives Matter promotes violence. Um, just like in the 1960s civil rights protests led by MLK, um, you know, sometimes riots uh, emerge and sometimes property is destroyed. Um, and you see, you know, uh, there are moral psychologists who are helping us understand some of this stuff. I find them really, really helpful. And moral psychologists have kind of noted there are different, there are different people appeal to different foundations for morality. And progressives, folks on the left, um, are usually firing on things like fairness. Is anyone being, is, is anything unequal or is there an equity and harm? Like, is anyone being hurt here? Every, no one should be able to, you know, no one should be hurt. Um, there are other though, uh, foundations of morality and conservative, especially conservative white Christians often appeal to those and those are firing as even more important than fairness. Um, so things like uh, respect and authority to the, you know, respect to the authorities um, or purity and what they, what, you know, what, what they've deemed as, as purity. So respect for the authorities, respect for law and order, right? So violence is immoral uh, for, for these folks. And so therefore, you know, you see some opposition on that front. Um, of course, as, as Martin Luther King Jr. said um, of the, you know, Watts riots and others right after that, um, you know, riots and the stuff that comes with them is the language of the unheard even though he did not support violence he said the only the only riot prevention is justice um, and i agree with him um, i think pointing to instances of violence and saying well this whole program's messed up is is um not under not learning from history because we've been there we've done that um king said you know I don't want violence. I don't want property destroyed, but be aware of what, like that's happening because this is the, you're hearing a voice. You're hearing the voice of the oppressed. Um, as one of my colleagues put it in a somewhat awkward interview when she was being hired, um, she, you know, she, she was asked and she's a black woman, you know, do you support violence? Um, you know, violence to achieve civil rights. She's like, well, no, I don't think it's the first thing, but if somebody's got their boot on my neck, I'm going to push it off. Um, and I thought that was a really good, a really good, um, a really good response. So two is, is violence. Third, uh, another reason that you see uh, some white Christians opposing Black Lives Matter, some of them just don't think systemic racism exists. Um, and this is where you get into like not paying attention or uh, interested in actual facts and, and studies and figures. Um, that's one. And so that's that individualistic stuff we were talking about earlier, the, the white evangelical toolkit, as sociologists have explained it so well in the previous point I was noting, everything is explained by free will accountable individuals. 
Uh, and therefore, when you have racism, it's just an individual being mean. You know, it's a bad apple. Um, and we need to fix those individuals. And that's the way we do it. Systemic racism is, is, is a, you know, a thing that doesn't really exist. Another thing there is that the gospel is not about social justice. So this goes all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century when conservative Christians opposed the social gospel movement. Now, I went back actually earlier today this week because I was responding to someone about some of these issues. And I was, I was just flipping through my marks on Walter Rauschenbusch, who is uh, kind of the father of libera uh, so social um social Christianity or the social gospel. Um, and, you know, they're, basically they're just arguing, yes, individual individuals need saved, but so do structures and societies and policies. Like these all need redeemed. The gospel speaks to all of them. Um, and from that time on, really conservatives really locked in, white conservatives locked in and said, whoa, 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 whoa. The gospel is about converting individuals. And that's it. Like we convert individuals and we hope those individuals have a positive influence on their society and those people around them. Um, but the gospel is not about, you know, fi like fixing laws or policies. Now, that's not usually a, from conservatives. That's not usually upheld consistently. But nonetheless, that's what that's that is the um, a trope when we're talking about social justice and Black Lives Matter. And then finally, the fourth. And this is the most um, incendiary and and um, falling in line with racist past. Uh, often they'll call Black Lives Matter Marxist or cultural Marxist. You all have no doubt seen this stuff. Uh, in fact, I've drawn folks who want to talk about this to the exact parallels of the 1960s, white Christians who opposed Martin Luther King Jr. They said the exact same stuff. Um, so, so here, when this stuff comes up, I always just say, well, which part of Marx? <laughs> because, you know, you can come up with three or four planks of Marxism and it's like, yeah, people are using class and yes, um, all kinds of Marxist theorists in, in terms of sociologists and, and others. Um, but what they are using, what they are saying when they're saying this is, is really a boogeyman. It doesn't carry any weight and it goes way, 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 way back to the Cold War era where um, communism and sat Satanism are like kind of wrapped up together. Uh, like Billy Graham, he didn't see any really separation between communism and, and Satanism. Um, and so his Christianity was always about saving people and protecting the world from communism. Like those things went hand in hand and you can see that in his sermon. So from that time on, really, you get this idea that like, oh, anybody that's after social justice, and this is again, this is on the right wing of the conservative folks, but it's there. You see it in some of the conservative secular folks as well. All right, so Black Lives Matter and why some Christians uh, re uh, respond uh, in negative ways. All of that stuff then helps us, I think the biggest, um, one of the most helpful ideas to wrap your mind around different responses currently, and maybe this isn't the pressing thing for you all, maybe everybody's kind of on the same board, but I know you all are dealing with folks who have different responses, is what um, one sociologist calls the racial perception gap. And all he means by that, and I'm especially thinking about Robert Jones, Robert P. Jones, uh, in his book, The End of White Christian America, um, he, um, he means that and he's especially talking about black and white people, but he would extend this to people of color. And he shows this and I'll show you some stats here in a minute. Perceive the world in very different ways. So black and white people have very different perceptions of the world we live in and therefore very different explanations about why things are happening and what the fixes are. So, for instance, I've got a picture here of Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son and in 2015 during the protests in Ferguson here's what Franklin Graham sent off in a uh, in a Facebook post you know where he's got 1.4 million uh, Facebook fans he said this okay and this is this is demonstrating the racial perception gap what Franklin Graham as a white evangelical um, saw as the problem and the solution in Ferguson Listen up, Blacks, Whites, Latinos, and everybody else. Most police shootings can be avoided. It comes down to, here it comes, all right? Thinking about the psychological foundations for morality. It comes down to respect for authority and obedience. Respect for authority and obedience. If a police officer tells you to stop, you stop. If a police officer tells you to put your hands in the air, you put your hands in the air. 
if a police officer tells you to lay down face first with your hands behind your back, you lay down face first with your hands behind your back. It's as simple as that. Even if you think the police officer is, officer is wrong, you obey. So obviously from his white evangelical perspective, there are a number of things that that are required as, you know, sort of preliminaries before you could even say this, you trust the authorities because, you know, they were created for you and for your society and they've always protected you and your society. Right. And so he's got this deep trust in, you know, in this particular community police, uh, they're the, you know, quote unquote, good guys. Uh, and so other communities in America have experienced the exact opposite. In fact, oftentimes these state sanctioned actors have destroyed black communities. Right. And so like, yeah, if you're like what he doesn't get there, right, is the different places and the different experiences of police in America. Uh, and so this is demonstrating the racial perception gap. Now, people, some evangelicals, especially black and Hispanic, um, and Asian American and some white evangelicals then responded and just wore him out. They said this, Franklin, Reverend Graham, your insistence that blacks, whites, Latinos, and everybody else listen up was crude, insensitive, and paternalistic. The fact that you identify a widely acknowledged social injustice as simple reveals your lack of empathy and understanding of the depth of sin that some in the body have suffered under the weight of our broken justice system. It also reveals a cavalier disregard for the enduring impacts and outcomes of the legal regimes that enslaved and oppressed people of color, made in the image of God, from Native American genocide and containment to colonial and antebellum slavery, through Jim Crow and peonage, to our current systems of mass incarceration and criminalization. And so you get this immediate response, right, to him. But this, that is an instance that represents these figures I'm about to show you. Now I'm going to start by showing you the racial perception gap just by race. But then I'm going to dig down and get and add religion as well. Because what we're, what we're going to see, that what you're going to see is the more white and the more white evangelical you are, the bigger the gap. The bigger the gap from how you see the world and how black people. Americans experience the world. So here you're seeing when you when asked, and this is by by the way, this is a 2015 American Value Survey. So um, it this will this it will not be the same in 2021. 2020 actually it was significant. George Floyd did there were some there were some shifts, and I've seen some studies that, that is not the same here. It has shifted some. So um, so some of these things are changing. But if, when asked, do you think recent killings of American African American men by police are isolated incidents that is bad apples individualistic explanation, or are they part of a broader pattern so systems policies. Um, of how police treat African Americans when you take all of Americans as a whole about 53% think these are just isolated incidents right that th this is not part of a broader pattern it's not part of the clear you know criminaliz criminalization of particular things that black people do or wear or say right i mean because that is that did that has happened and so this is fun to, but these are this is not are these people right or wrong it's just helping you understand the the actual um perspective uh, and only 44 percent see them as a broad pattern now when you go down and look at just the white white people then that number shifts right so so two-thirds of white people think these are just isolated incidents these are just you know the quote-unquote bad apple whereas 34 percent you know see them as a broader pattern you move to hispanic you get less right you, you almost flip that because you know hispanic communities are experiencing policing very differently so you get this you get 59 and 41 but then look at look at the black um numbers here 81% say this is a pattern. Now, what I'm talking about with the perception gap, look at that, the white from, the, from, from white to black, we're talking about a 45%, 50% perception gap. It's almost like we're living on different planets. It's like we're inhabiting different planets in terms of explanation for what's happening. I don't have many other ways to explain this except just clear experience. Um, which is why over and over again on how do we move forward, it's going to be be in solidarity with listen, 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 learn from, learn from, learn from, or else you will continue to perceive reality in very white ways and not understand the way that other people are experiencing these systems. Second here, let, let's add in now, this is a, about the same question, same study. But now we're going to break it down by white unaffiliated as people that marked I'm not affiliated with religious group. And then we're going to look at 
white mainline and white evangelical. So when all of black folks here are 74% of black folks are saying in the way that this one's worded, uh, recent killings of African-American men by police are part of a broader pattern of how police treat African-Americans. Uh, and so three quarters of black people in America say, yeah, uh, that's right. Whereas, you know, 60, so if you're unaffiliated with religion, unaffiliated with Christianity or other religious groups, you, 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 the perception gap is not that far off. There's something about religious ideology or something about the way that we've, you know, become formed or something like that, that is, that is making our perception uh, in certain ways. And so you get a white, white mainline Protestant, white mainline Protestants. Now you're starting to get a pretty good, pretty big gap there, right? You've got a 30% gap between black Americans and white mainline Protestants. Then when you go to white evangelical, you can just see this gap getting bigger and bigger. Now, now we're, we're back up to that 45, 45%, 50% gap where we're living on, on different, um, planets. One more that I'll show you, and I think the point, you've, you've understood the point. Um, police officers generally treat Blacks and other minorities the same as whites. So is, is there equal treatment um, from police? And for all Americans, you see that only 41% agree. So there's actually a majority of Americans right now who are aware that police treat different folks, you know, differently um, based on race, or ethnicity, now, white evangelicals, though, continue to have a pretty, you know, a pretty, um, a lot of confidence in the policing system and the justice system. So 62%, uh, this is again, 2015. So this will, this will have changed. Um, all kinds of folks in America, you know, watch George Floyd, um, watched Ahmaud, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, like, and no, right? I mean, and it's like, oh, wow. Um, and so this would change, this would go down a little bit. When you get to white mainline Protestant, you know, you're back, you're, you're closer to the American, the broader American consensus. But look, as we move down um, to unaffiliated, you get less and less, right? You get more and more vision perspective that is similar to that of um, Black and other minority communities. Um, yeah, and so this is just a, a, the basic idea here is the racial perception gap. People are viewing things very, very differently. Uh, I've got a Jamar Tisby tweet here because I think he's, and this is going to come up again later on too. He says, if you aim for diversity without an emphasis on justice and equity, then you leave a trail of traumatized black Christians and other Christians of color in your wake. If you aim for justice, which gets you in solidarity with then you get racial and ethnic diversity in the process. Um, this I'm going to come back to in terms of solution, ideas for solutions. Um, but this is important, I think, for the racial perception gap. How do we bring that? How do we reduce that gap? Um, well, it's going to be working for working for justice. I think it's one of the answers to that. There are some important mainline initiatives going on right now. Um, I'm mo most aware of this one because the Disciples of Christ are in my wheelhouse in terms of uh, the tradition I'm from. Um, and so you're seeing here the Reverend Dr. William Barber II, who is a Disciples of Christ minister, that is Christian Church Disciples of Christ, which is one of the mainline uh, denominations, has started, restarted the Poor People's Campaign that Martin Luther King Jr. started right before he died, um, which is really working for poor um, poor folks in general. And this is a, this is a really important endeavor. I'm not going to talk much more about it. I, I can say a little bit more about it later on. Of course, I want to throw in, you know, becoming beloved community as another mainline effort, right? Um, uh, so cheer, you know, cheers to you all. Um, keep after it, keep working for it. The one last thing I wanted to talk that we didn't talk about last time is one solution, one, one solution people are having to, how can we, how can we amend, how can we better race relations? How can we make our race relations better, not just in society, but in the church? What are some of the options? What are some of the solutions? And so one of the big movements right now, and really in the last two decades, two and a half decades, um, has been, hey, we should we should start multiracial churches and multi-ethnic um, churches and bring people together, right? And this is rooted in um, this idea of what, what, you know, social psychologists call contact theory. Um, that is, you can't know, know someone unless you're with them, <laughs> in contact with them. And we know right now that, you know, because we have the studies, you know, Robert P. Jones, he, he gives these in his book and he can and we continue to see this. The large majority of white people in America have no, no friends of color who are like close friends, right? Like close friends in what they call, um, I can't remember the exact name the sociologists use for it, but like in your core network, people 
whose day daily life you know about and hear about uh, and and live for and work for um, it is it is over 90 percent um, and so that's significant and so one of the things that upholds this racial perception gap is that a lot of white folks just don't have any idea what's like the daily experience of uh, people of color. And so one of the one of the one of the solutions then has been, well, well, let's figure out ways to be in contact and to form good, genuine, real relationships. And this is one of the things, too, that um, one of the questions I'll just read the question. Um, the question, this is from Gordon. Um, and he said, you know, on Sunday mornings, America and maybe all churches tend to be segregated by race and income, among other characteristics. So sociologically, the Episcopal Church of the Ascension is what I would describe as a tall steeple church in regard to architecture, programming, and practices, including Sunday morning services, liturgy, and music. Church of the Ascension is also a LGBT affirming church in practice and welcomes members of various races, ages, and income groups. Keeping the flavor of the church, which has resulted in a large membership, specifically what can be done to attract additional and more diverse members, especially black members. So let me copy that actually, and I'll throw that over here in the, uh, in the chat. And I'm about to unshare my screen in just a minute. Um, I did wanna work through this. I'll copy that in just a minute. Let me just finish unpacking this. Um, so multiracial churches is one option. Like how do we become multiracial? Because the idea that's that's better, that's good, that will help us. Um, that looks like the kingdom of God. That's, that's part of the Christian vision. One of the things that's happened though, and you're looking at a 2020 study here, is that we've had a, the multiracial church move, by the way, has been, has like, it's been pretty successful in terms of numbers. Just to give you a quick number in 2000, let's see, in get my numbers here. In 1998, only 6% of Christi Christian communities were multiracial. And just so you're aware, multiracial, the category means 20% or more are from the non-dominant group. That's like supposed to be the magic number, right? And you hopefully you're already thinking like, I don't know if you could have an, like a, a legit multi-ethnic church if there's only, you know, if 80% are still dominant from the dominant culture. But that's the mark, right? 20% or more from the non-dominant group then you're considered a multi-racial church. So in 1998, so, you know, 20, 20 years ago, only 6% of churches were that in that category. In 2019, it was up to 16%. I think it's even nudged up a little bit more than that. And that is because of an exerted, uh, like an effort, like a real deliberate effort to create, to found, to start uh, multi-ethnic churches. One of the problems though, and even like key leaders and actually on this particular NPR story and write up that I've, that I've got listed here, there are a couple of the leaders of this who are actually backing off and saying, we're, we're actually thinking this might not be the right way forward. Because as you can see from the numbers, it's been really hard to get um, it actually really diverse. White people in most of these multiracial churches are the dominant group. And one of the problems with that is it's, oh, it's very, very difficult. Talk to any multi-ethnic church planter or pra uh, uh, person who practices. Um, it is so hard because people don't just naturally give up their cultures, especially when it's about, here's how I'm used to experiencing God. Here's how I, here's how I envision what like, it looks like to come together and worship. You know what I mean? And even though we don't always recognize it, like our ethnic and racial cultures in our churches run very, very deep and they're very, very clear. And so what happens then is usually if you have 50% in the church who are white and the others are coming from various um, various ethnic backgrounds, you end up more often than not getting that assimilation vision, like just assimilate, assimilate to white culture and white leadership, et cetera. Now, people have pushed hard and tried hard to do this. So others are actually saying, even right now, some of the leaders in the movement are saying, you know what? Um, diversity in the building should not necessarily be our first goal. Instead, Maybe what we should do is to work for justice and to work for policies in our society and in our churches that eliminate racial disparities and inequities. And then organically and naturally, we build some kind of solidarity and some kind of trust and become places 
where various groups are feel welcome and and become part of the become part of the of the like of the culture naturally. So this is coming back to Jamar Tisby's quote: "If you aim for diversity without an emphasis on justice and equity, then you leave a trail of traumatized Black Christians and other Christians of color in your wake. If you aim for justice, then you get racial and ethnic diversity in the process." And so what I'm telling you is, some of the major advocates for multi-ethnic or multiracial churches uh, are really kind of backing off and saying, "You know what? Maybe the the goal should be." justice because what happens is if you you work hard to create a a, a multiracial space but then you pretend like black bodies in the streets and in society don't matter or aren't part of that then you just wound your community and you end up with a lot of hurt people and we've seen that play out over and over um and so let me uh put that question in here real quickly um that was the question and then at the end there, I've listed um, to that one particular question, I've listed, you know, there are several books, by the way, that help. There, there are powerful sociological forces that drive us apart. And don't worry, these are all going to be on the handout that I'm giving you. So I'm going to show you, I'll, I'll, I'll use some of these sources. But Christina Cleveland, uh, her book, Disunity in Christ, Uncovering the Hidden Forces that Keep Us Apart. You know, she's a, she's coming from a, um, a, a Black female perspective who has been in evangelical spaces and working for racial reconciliation, racial, racial justice. She's a social psychologist. So she's using, she's bringing that to bear on this. And she unpacks some of those sociological forces that just are, part of how we operate we get together with people who are like us um that's what happens when you get together with with just naturally uh and like she and other people note american religion has very much been driven by a market kind of appeal that is you you are looking for the kind of experience and the kind of religious goods a religious package that speaks to you it just so happens that the religious package that speaks to you speaks to other people from, from your racial and ethnic background, from your socioeconomic, um, you know, like bracket. So it's just very, very hard The the basic sociological forces and the way that we have kind of come to envision um, what religion looks like and what we ought to be after in our Christian experience. Those are powerful forces that kind of land us in homogenous churches, ethnically homogenous, racially homogenous, and in terms of class homogenous as well. So I've just noted there are powerful sociological forces we can't deny, but some of those I think we need to work against. I think the American conception of religion that is that that permeates our vision and that drives us into people to be to be with people who are just like us, it doesn't seem sinister as Christina Cleveland, she puts it this way. She's like, it doesn't seem sinister in intent necessarily but that does not mean it doesn't have sinister outcomes um sometimes our homogeneity can and the racial perception gap is one of those places um and so that's an important one let me come back to another question that people have put forward and and we're at a place now where i'm going to start just riffing so if you want to if you want to come in um and uh ask a question that's good i'm going to post another i'm going to i'm going to throw another question in here that um that I got this week, uh, and this is from Ann, and Ann was saying, look, we've learned that organized religion and Christian churches remain silent and uh, cautious during the civil rights. What do you think we're silent about today? Which is a great question, right? Because um, as a historian, one of the things that causes me great humility, but also just I'm terrified about, is missing being totally like missing clear injustices because of the blinders like we all are embedded in time and space and we can't fully get out we're like we're like in some ways governed <laughs> by our historical moment i'm, I'm not I, you know i'm not talking about determinism but i am talking about we are powerfully powerfully in some ways captive to our time and space it can be in any other way and that creates blinders And so the question for me and what for my students and for you all is when we read people like in the 1960s who are so absolutely blind about key injustices, even while people are telling them to their face this clear thing that is happening, um, the thing that the thing that terrifies me is like, okay, so so what do we how do we make sure that we are not missing this? Um, It's going to come back to the first thing that listed on every on throughout the arc of racial justice, which I'll get to in a a moment, which is 
you got to listen. You got to listen. You got to listen. <laughs> we all have to listen. The posture of listening, the posture of curiosity. Anytime something seems like if you look over here and someone's burning a building down out of sheer because of they're saying like we are oppressed we will not take it any longer the the initial reaction should be like i can't believe that they're hurting your property the initial should reaction should be i can't believe someone is so wounded that they would take to the streets like this and i need to listen and understand why um listen 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 that's got to be the knee jerk reaction i think uh the thing i think that we're missing today by the way is colorblind racism um colorblind racism and this is where again i'm not trying to step on anyone's toes i don't know uh you know i i know sylvia the most right and we've only you know we've only had conversations on the phone and and, and we and we've talked so i know her the best so i don't know where all you're all coming from but this is one of those places where mainline folks who have been on the liberal side and been on the progressive side in terms of advocating for moving forward since the 1970s mainline christians in polls mainline white Christians have have often been in support of colorblind policies. That is policies that don't take color into account and assume that everybody is starting like with equality. So a colorblind policy, right, assumes that if you don't pay attention to color, then you then you pass a law. I mean, I talked about this a little bit last week. You pass a law that is that everyone experiences in the exact same way right? So it doesn't take anything into account. The problem with colorblind policies is that it doesn't take into account the historic discrimination and disparities that we currently have, right? Like, I mean, you know, it, you read about Baltimore and the way that white powerful people created laws that segregated Baltimore in, you know, the early 1900s. And today there are multiple neighborhoods in Baltimore with lower life expectancies than North Korea and Syria. Today, that happened for a reason. That was white people who made policies, put people in places, and it became almost impossible to get out of those to get out of those places. Uh, then you take away education opportunities, you take away job opportunities, you take away any way to get out, and then. And then you add in people who are there with the economic means to get out can, and you get the socioeconomic um, phenomenon or tragedy of white flight, which takes taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And so what you get then is colorblind racism. Like all of these moves that since the 1970s haven't taken color into account, assuming that they can somehow achieve equity. And that's the difference between equality and equity. Equity is like giving you know a, a four foot person, a six foot person, and a seven foot foot person, foot person a one a one foot tall box, and saying, okay, all of you can equally now look over this six foot fence, right? You can envision the picture, right? That doesn't work because there is a four foot person that cannot see over the fence. And then to make the analogy fully, it would be like that person is four feet tall because of, and then you point to three hundred years of policies that led to a four foot person. And so I think that's really, really important to be aware of. So I think we're missing that. That's very hard. So what, there's a book, uh, let, me, let me grab it to you and show you. Uh, and it's the, it's the major book along these lines. Um, it's called Racist, Racism Without Racists. Racism Without Racists. This also is on my reading list, so don't worry. It, it is already written down for you, and it's coming soon. But Racism Without Racists, it's now in its fifth edition. It's called Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in America. Just because race is not in the actual title doesn't mean that it's not a racist policy. So, for instance, when you have you, – you say, oh, we're going to crack down and have law and order politics and law and order policies – like you get with Nixon and, and then especially Reagan and even Clinton, you, you have this policy, you all are probably familiar with this because it's so egregious and so racist, where you provide mandatory sentencing for a particular drug, but it's one 100 times harsher for that cocaine the way that black people are using it, almost all black people are using it versus the way that white people are using it right? Crack versus powder. It's 100 times difference. That doesn't even change until Obama. And there's, color is not in the actual law, but it says if you're black and using, you will, you will get in prison, you won't be able to get out, 
you will not be able to get out because the sentence is going to be so strong. Um, whereas if you're white, uh, because it, so you, you understand, I don't need to keep going on this. This is the place that I think is the most sinister um, where we continue to have major racial disparities happening because of our laws, because of our policies um, that we have to reckon with. It's not like people aren't screaming this from the mountaintops. People are screaming it from the mountaintops. Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow screamed it from the mountaintops. It's now in a 10th tenth, tenth, um, edition. She, I mean, it's just straight, straight up. She just calls mass incarceration The New Jim Crow. And she shows with just utter precision and detail after detail how we built a system to lock black people and people of color up disproportionately through our laws and we have to come after that we have to come after that as christians we have to come after that as people uh who are part of our society so that's a really long answer um sorry and to that but that's a really long answer let me let me answer another one of these questions um joy sent a, a question and i think that's going to get me actually i'm gonna i'm gonna do glenn's real quick and then i'll do joy's because joy's is a good way to, to transition into um what I want to do last. So uh, I'd like to hear more about how some churches and denominations, um, this is from Glenn, uh, have done what they've done to overcome the racial divide between congregations that occurred around the time of the Civil War and the Jim Crow era, right? So you all remember after Civil War, one of the major shifts you get is just a straight independence of Black Christians. They just get out of white spaces because of the racism that they experienced in these white churches and created independent congregations and independent denominations. Are there congregations or even whole denominations that have begun to merge with black churches that uh, drew away? That's a really great question. And I've not actually taken that up as a research um, question. How did they manage it? How did they manage it? Manage it? And you'll note that I put, you know, the DOC chapter. So uh, the Disciples of Christ is the denomination I'm most familiar with. And like other denominations, the black Disciples of Christ separated from the white disciples. They didn't do it fully until 1917 officially, but it was kind of already happening. And so in 1917, you get a convention for the black disciples of Christ and a convention for the white disciples of Christ. But the white and black, they were, they were in conversation throughout the decades. In the 1960s, oh, cool. Gigi, which, uh, which, which disciples of Christ school? I went to Barton College. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And so um, and so what happens in the 1960s, they actually came back together um, and, and it became official in 1969. And so now the National Convocation, which is the, 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 the black ministry, there's also a Hispanic ministry and an Asian American ministry that is its own ministry within the church, but it is a part of the broader a part of the broader church. And I'm familiar with that when I'm on a board for the Disciples of Christ Historical Society. So I'm constantly meeting with that. And, and, the, and it has, I mean, it is serious, serious racial and ethnic di diversity in that denomination and in all of the ministries. There is a chapter in Slavery's Long Shadow. So one of the, one of the major historians in the Disciples of Christ did a chapter and, and, and looked at exactly what disciples have done to try to overcome racism. And, you know, Episcopal Church has their own story, and, and you, all, you all are more familiar with some of those stories than I am. I find it interesting, and they, they, they located, they, they came up with 12, like 12 ways, 12 things disciples have done to try to combat racism. And one of those things was one of the things that, they, that, that the disciples did was like, you know, in order to become an anti-racist church, that was a 2020 goal. We're going to become an anti-racist church. And they set these goals down at the beginning of the century, you know, and they're, they're trying to they're trying to get there like all of us. Right. Um, and one of the one of the and they, they asked, they did interviews with disciples of Christ leaders and ministers on the ground to say, how do you think these have done? How effective have they been? And so a response to all of these was very effective, somewhat effective, not effective, and no opinion. One of the things was new congregations, so like new multiracial congregations was one of the ideas. Let's plant new congregations, which from the, from the ground up are multiracial, multiethnic. Uh, seven said somewhat effective, but 10 said not effective, which was really interesting. They thought this isn't the way forward. So that's another thing to be thinking about. So that's a Disciples of Christ story. They're still in the middle of it. Um, and um, that's, that's and you, you could read that chapter in the book to see their 12 things that they've done. Some of them you'd be very aware of. And like, oh, yeah, yeah, the Episcopal Church has done something like that. Others might be new to you. One last question here, which will get me into um, the last thing I want to show, uh, share with you, which is the arc 
of racial justice. Um, okay, and this one comes from Joy, and Joy is saying like, um, you know, so how do we move forward? So that's what I want to do now uh, for the rest of our time and the rest of our discussion time. Uh, what I want to ask uh, is what do I see as the best way forward in this divided country? How to find a way to convince folks to accept reliable data and the scientific method in investigating anything or investing anything, I think investigating anything. I do have to admit, I've been sorely disappointed in my fellow Americans and I assume all of us are somewhat uh, distraught about some of this. You know, I'm reading right now, I'm just about done with a book from Adam Grant, who again is a, you know, he's an organizational psychologist. I think the psychologists are really helping us um, understand how to navigate some of this wild stuff because they're trying to get under the hood of what on the surface just seems absolute irrationality. Um, and so his book is called Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. I've put that in here because it's not actually on my list. I mean, I'm just reading it. It just came out this year. But he's arguing for what he calls motivational interviewing. And it's really, really good. And he's, he's taking up that particular question. How do we, how do we have conversations? Um, he's not just looking at race or anything like that. He's actually looking at the, the total, uh, sort of our current divided moment. What are some of the things? I think you would, you would uh, like the book. And it's very helpful, this motivational interviewing idea, which is all about questioning and figuring out ways to bring people along and help them explore the irrationality of their own position. Um, and, and also learn yourself along the way. So it's, it's, it's psychologically savvy ways to have conversations. He's doing that. I'll point to another thing as well here in just a moment. I'm going to have to um, just share my screen with you. I was going to just, I was going to um, download this file, but for whatever reason, uh, my Zoom right now is not wanting, not letting me um, link stuff or attach a file in the chat. But I have sent this to Sylvia and Gigi. Um, Caroline. So um, you all will have access to this, but let me just walk you through um, this handout that I've that I've made and I've used in ch in, in churches and in other and in, in, in conferences for scholars and stuff like that. Uh, and it's um, basically me using a oh, not that one using Jamar Tisby. Um, you all see this? You can see this, okay? Yep. Um, let me actually blow that up a little bit. And so what you're seeing here is, okay, so what should we do? What do we, what do, we do to move forward? Um, Jamar Tisby, who his first book uh, is called The Color of Compromise, um, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity and Racism. That is on the list here. So it's the book, I would say, if you want to know about the history that I have unpacked, there's no better one volume than this one, Jamar Tisby. Um, the Color of Compromise, The Truth About American Church's Complicity and Racism. As you can imagine, this last year, it shot to the New York Times bestseller list. Um, and it's really, really good. He's coming at it from a um, evangelical or, you know, more conservative-ish, but he's coming at it from a Protestant um, perspective. And he's a Black Christian, a Black leader um, in the Presbyterian churches. Uh, or actually, he's kind of non-denominational, I think, now. Um, but his second book, which just came out, is How to Fight Racism. Um, and that's Courageous Christianity and the Journey Toward Racial Justice. So what he is putting forward, what Jamar Tisby is putting forward in both of these books, he has one chapter at the end of The Color of Compromise, but then this whole book takes up this question, right? So we could, we could do a whole series just going through this book, um, which is How to Fight Racism. He uses the arc of racial justice. So what is the arc of racial justice? It's awareness, it's relationships, and it is commitment. Okay, so awareness, um, relationships, and commitment. So let me walk you through just, and, and these can happen, he says, you know, it's not like, okay, you do this one, and then you do that one, and then you do that one, you know, there's a lot of cross pollination here. Uh, and, and, you know, you do some here, you do some there, you constantly are making yourself grow in all of these ways. But awareness is first, it's kind of what we've been doing in this class. Um, the knowledge and the information and the data required to fight racism. Now, data and facts don't always matter. And I think one of you sent that to me and you know, your questions, you could have a mountain of evidence and people are still like, nope. Uh, and that is, that is very clear right now. But it is something that you have to have in order to fight racism. And so you'll see me always at the very beginning saying, listen to diverse voices. Now, this is not just Tisby stuff. This is Tisby. And then as I read books, I've been adding to this over the last few years. But listen to diverse voices. You gotta, we have to find a way to listen to the people speaking right now 
um, from the margins, people who are uh, experiencing oppression, uh, people who are experiencing deeply uh, the inequities that we've been talking about. Listen, 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 listen. I uh, argue that right now we're dealing with a, cult a culture that really celebrates um, the posture of defensiveness. You know the posture, is, which is hands sweaty, heart beating fast, and and you know it's really really hard to listen and to have a conversation. Uh, and uh, I think an antidote to the culture uh, and the posture of defensiveness is the posture of curiosity. So I think we need to cultivate the posture of curiosity. Uh, and one of the ways that we can do this individually is through the spiritual practice of examine, which is, you know, at the end of the day, you think about and deliberately pause and just think about your day. When were you curious? When were you defensive? When, you, when did you ask questions? When did you help people come their better selves? That kind of thing. Uh, and then all these other things on here you're going to be aware of, right? Documentaries, social media, um, diversify it, do your own research. A lot of these are aimed especially at white folks who have the large burden to bear here on ending racism um, or attacking it at least and working for justice. So do your own re re research. Don't ask, oh, don't always depend on your friend of color to do your research for you. You should do your own, though certainly ask your friends about their experiences start a book club, inform yourself about current racial disparities. You know, there's studies coming out all the time. There's a yearly study, um, the state of black America every year that comes out and it looks at and has is these really interesting tools to measure inequity. Um, be aware of those things. So relationships, the personal, professional and community networks needed to foster cross-racial empathy and solidarity. Uh, and so, you know, first off and foremost, listen, listen, listen to diverse voices. Um, identify people different from you that you could know or that you do know and ask about their experiences, you know, intentionally diversify your close friend network, um, find new places to hang out, join a sport or a club or an activity with people who are different from you, make yourself a little uncomfortable, learn about churches, uh, the work of churches whose memberships predominantly um, people of color or a different ethnic, ethnic group. Um, find ways to forge meaningful relationships, start a friendship initiative or an intergroup dialogue. Uh, move, move. you know, if you're getting real serious here, move to uh, a neighborhood of people different from you, uh, but be very careful not to, you know, contribute to gentrification, which is another place we're dealing with inequity. Um, shop in neighborhoods that struggle economically. We can make that, we can make that list longer. And then finally, commitment. This is like, okay, boots on the ground. We got to do this stuff. The, the actions necessary to deconstruct laws and policies that create and perpetuate racial inequity and replace them with ones that lead to equity for people of all races and ethnicity. So again, we're going to listen, 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 listen. Um, I'm not coming in guns blazing saying, here's my solution for everything that you're experiencing in your community. Uh, I'm going to listen and come alongside, get under the leadership of people in the communities who are uh, working for justice, who are experiencing the most oppression. Uh, cultivate empathy rather than apathy. As a, a white man, I have to wake up and daily make the conscious decision, and in, including where I live, um, which is part of the, just the systemic structural stuff that continues to segregate our society. You know, my choice of where I live um, is part of those broader systemic issues. And I have to own that and every day wake up saying like, what can I do to deliberately engage this and not be apathetic? because my daily experience is not one of oppression for myself. Um, and so we all have to own that, work for it every, every day. Um, repent, right? Uh, open repentance and lament services about where our nation and where our uh, communities and our churches uh, have um, contributed to racism and racial inequities. Always, always, always denounce racism every time it arises. This can be very hard if you're in a white group, because as the psychologists help us understand, um, it is psychologically and socially costly if you're with a bunch of white people and you're white to break uh, with white solidarity. Um, you know, we have whole books on that right now, which I've read because it's like, this is hard to do, but it's always, always, always more costly to you and to everyone else in our society to not denounce it in all its forms. Create things for racial justice. Join things like Justice Knox. There's a big meeting downtown tomorrow night for Justice Knox. Um, somebody's mentioned that and, and it's come up in our conversations more than once. Join an organization. Um, you could join a church, right? You could join a, a predominantly black church or a, a, a church that has diverse ethnicities and leadership, but just be be very careful about that if you're white and you're wanting to do that, because sometimes black spaces are sacred and don't need racial anxiety is real. Uh, the more the white folks 
are, you know, in that space. And sometimes because of the long history here, worship spaces are some of the few spaces that people of color can be free without racial anxiety. And racial anxiety is very real. I mean, we have whole books on that. And, and you know, I've read those as well, trying to understand the, the, the dynamics, you know, of what's happening here. And so just be sure you're welcome. Uh, and there are several other things, like I said, I'm, this is coming out to you all. I'm not hiding this as a resource for you. And then I've got an annotated reading list and a short annotations, right? And I'm telling you, here are my favorite books. And I tell you in a, in a, in a line or two, what those books do and the perspective they're coming from. There's a lot of psychology on here. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of ministry practitioners. There's two pages of it there. And there are a few, um, a, a few websites as well. Uh, and so I see we're at 9.59. I'll be happy to keep talking about questions. Oh, thanks, Gigi. Got the uh, Interrupting Racism handout up there in the chat for those of you who want to download it. Okay, I'll stop. Dr. Gorman, you're just, you're, you're a person that I would love to be able to just take with me everywhere I go to say, what shall I do next? And I think that we all are kind of in the position because none of us know the answers to, to everything. And I think that even we're all struggling with what's going on in society now. And, and, and that is why I think that we are really blessed to be able um, as Episcopal people um, and to have this parish and to talk about these things. Um, I've been really amazed at, at what has been happening to us as Christians in Knoxville. So I am eternally grateful. All right, um, and we have a committee member this morning who's gonna pray us out. And then after we have our closing prayer, those of you who want to stay around, we're gonna have coffee hour and we'll be able to talk with our, with our Dr. Gorman um, for a little while longer. So Emily Vreeland, will you pray us out? Praise be to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Lord, forgive us for our past transgressions against each other. We have called out to you and we have shown us great and hidden things that we had not known before. Let these truths dwell in our hearts. Help us to search for and find your goodness among all those we encounter in our daily lives. Show us ways to respect and honor each other as we hold sacred all lives. Speak to our hearts so we may hear your voice. Open our eyes to truth, calm our doubts and fears. And God, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable, Help us to put these things into our daily actions and truly be the people you mean for us to be. Amen. Wonderful prayer. Thank you so much, Emily. And becoming beloved um, 